Well, if you have your Bibles with us, you can with you, you can go ahead and turn to First Thessalonians chapter five, and we're going to read the fast, last few verses in that letter this morning and finish out this series where we've been preaching through this uh, first letter to the church at Thessalonica by the Apostle Paul. And so if you've been with us every Sunday or tuned in with us every Sunday as we preach through, then uh, you've read through the book with me if you followed along with the reading. And so uh, I hope that uh, through this that you've gained some better understanding of the Word of God, the return of Christ, which is a, a, a big theme, and and how to live in the last days. That's, uh, that's uh, you know, the theme of the, mess, or the letter, I think. And, and so follow along with me today as we read for our message that today we've called Being Made Like Jesus. Being Made Like Jesus. So uh, Paul finishes out this first letter by saying, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who will also do it. And he says, brethren, pray for us. And greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. And I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. This is the word of God. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we do thank you again for the opportunity we have to come together this morning and to freely worship you and Lord to read your word of truth. And God, we're, we pray this morning that you'd fill us with the power of your spirit, God, to deliver your word with power and authority clearly communicating the message that you have for us. And Lord, I pray that we'd all submit our hearts and lives to you, to follow you, to be made into the image of Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. So uh, one of the most fascinating characters in the Star Wars movie, The Empire Strikes Back, is a strange little fellow named Yoda, right? Uh, and Yoda lives on a slimy planet that I believe is called Dagoba. All you Star Wars uh, fanatics, am I right? <laughs> yeah. I wasn't sure if I was pronouncing that right or not. But most people are familiar with Yoda, uh, even if you're not all that familiar with Star Wars. But he sort of looks like a medieval gargoyle, uh, and he's the master teacher of the Jedi Knights, who are the universal agents of good and, and righteousness, right, in, in this fictional <laughs> movie series. Uh, and Luke Skywalker is uh, sent to Yoda for training to become a Jedi Knight. And, and when Yoda's trying to teach Luke to, uh, at one point, to try to raise his spaceship from a swamp, He's trying to teach him how to do that through sheer force of willpower alone, like telepathy or something, right? Of course, Luke fails, and and Yoda then levitates this spaceship out of the swamp just through his, the what do they call it, the the power of the force, right, I guess, I don't know, something like that, and, and so... Uh, and, and Luke's just amazed at, at what's happening, what he's seeing. And he says, I don't believe it. And Yoda replies with disgust and he says, this is why you fail. Because you don't believe it. Hmm. And so Yoda's point is that Luke Skywalker couldn't expect to become a Jedi Knight until he believed like a Jedi Knight. Luke's faith had to come to the point where it was a genuine imitation, a, a genuine rep, replica, if you will, of the faith of Yoda. And only when he had the same faith of Yoda could he do the things that Yoda did. Y'all following that? 
And so once he had that type of faith, then Luke would be as much like Yoda as Yoda himself. Well, I think we see something similar <laughs> implied in our text, and maybe in this whole letter of how to live like Jesus in the last days. Because if you go back to the very first chapter of 1 Thessalonians, if you remember, Paul told the church at Thessalonica, he told the members there, he said, you became imitators of us and the Lord. And he wrote, for you received the word in affliction with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit. So he, he's, he's comparing, you know, or, or stating that we are to become like Christ, right? That, that's one of the goals. And so now in closing out his letter, we see this again, where Paul's talking about being made in the image of Christ. And we see it in verse 23 in his prayer, where he says, the God of peace uh, can be described, or excuse me, he says, will sanctify you completely. And so what he's saying there, you know, first, when he, he's talking about the God of peace here, he, he's, he's saying that, um, you know, when we think about God of peace, the God, God, God's a God of peace in a lot of different ways. But the primary way that he's a God of peace is how he redeemed us and sent by sending Christ to die for our sins and through his atoning work, he's made a way for us who once were enemies of Christ because of our sin to be at peace with him. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14, it says that God himself is our peace. He is our peace, breaking down the partition. And that partition is the sin that separates us from God. And so the idea of the God of peace sanctifying completely, like it says in our text, points to this process of being made completely into the image of Christ. And one of the words, uh, the, the religious words, I guess you hear, that describing that process is, is sanctification. So you're going to probably hear that word a lot today, sanctification. And, and, uh, and, and that's a part of salvation. And, and what sanctification is, is basically it's the process of being made holy. When something was sanctified, the word used means to be set aside for holiness. Set aside for worship. And so like anything that was used in the temple uh, during their worship, it, it, it was set aside just for that. It's kind of like a wedding dress. You know, you, it's, a, it's a, a dress that you use one time. It's set aside for a wedding. And that's it sanctified it and when we're sanctified we're set apart for God you see and we're his and 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 but it involves this process of being made holy and that's what he's talking about when he says may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and look what he says after that he says and may your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless see that's holiness isn't it blameless and then he says at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ so we see the wholeness or the completeness of the sanctification with these words, spirit, soul, and body. There, it's a sort of a trichotomy of existence. A lot of people say you know, that human beings exist with a dichotomy. There's arguments. Others say trichotomy. It's a trichotomy that, that he shows here. And, you know, and when he talks about the spirit, the word spirit is, is the word for breath. But often when you see spirit mentioned in scripture, it refers to the intellectual part of a person. It's talking about the mind, you know, the way you process your intellectual thought. And, and then he talks about the soul and the soul's the spiritual part of who you are and how you exist. And that is the part that exists forever. And so some people sort of combine the soul and the spirit and say they're the same thing. And I'm not 100% sure that that's not exactly right. But then the other part he talks about is the body. And that's the one that's obvious to everyone, isn't it? We see that refers to the flesh. That's the tangible part of a person. But what the point he's making is that everything that makes you who you are is going to be sanctified and be presented blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when you believe in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're born again. And the Spirit of God fills you and your soul is saved forever. But you know what? Your body is not saved yet. How many of you know that? 
Now, I know that. I can feel it every day. My body is not saved. It's, it, it definitely has its problems, right? And so, so the, but, but what happens is there begins this spiritual growth. And you are conformed into the image of Christ as you learn and mature spiritually. And, and it can be a real struggle at times spiritually for, for us all. And, uh, but one day... You will be complete and you will be fully sanctified. That's what this, this passage is talking about. This is what he's talking about in verse 23. It's what Paul's referring to. And that's why he said you will be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word preserved, if I remember right, is the word for kept. That's basically the same word that the military uses to guard over something. That means once you're blameless, you're going to be kept blameless. Somebody say amen to that. Because, <laughs> you know, uh, you see, when sanctification is finished, you're going to be blameless and holy just like Jesus was blameless and holy. Jesus lived it out for us, didn't he? Without sin. And, and so he essentially says the same thing to the church at Philippi in Philippians 1.6. Paul writes to them and he says that he's confident of this very thing, that he who's begun a good work in you, that's God, isn't it? through saving you, he saved you and he's begun this work and he says he will complete it in the day of Jesus Christ. So there he's talking about the return of Christ. It's essentially, he's talking about exactly the same thing we just saw in verse 23. 1 Thessalonians 5. And, and, and when we've been preaching through this letter, we've been talking about living in the last days. And the message is about, uh, this message is about the completion of that. When, when we're going, the, those last days are going to be over. And this is what he's referring to here. When Jesus returns, you're going to be made like him. This is what he's getting at. You will be made like Jesus. And you will... Be like that forever. And so, and I want you to understand this morning that, that your, the main point of the sermon, I think we've, we've missed it here on our, on our, power slide, our PowerPoint is that you will be like Jesus. If you're a child of God, you will be made like Jesus. So and that's what this sermon's about. If you're one of his, then you will be made like Jesus. That's something to get excited about. That, that's something we ought to long for. And when, and, and, but how does it happen? And we've talked about this sanctification. Your sanctification. And God, for some reason, you know, he saves us and we're adopted as his children. And we have this hope that we're going to be made like him and live with him forever. But yet he still allows us to learn to grow spiritually and be made like him. And I don't know exactly, you know, why God does those things, but that's, that's part of his plan. And we have to live it out, don't we? So what I want to do today is I want to, I want to suggest that this sanctification is possible because of the faithfulness. And I see it as it's possible because of the faithfulness of God and the faithfulness of the church. And that's the main two big uh, parts of, of how you're going to be made like Jesus. But what I want to do is I want to suggest a few supporting truths that show us sort of how this happens for every believer to be made like Jesus. Okay, so that's what I want to point out in the text as we see just these closing remarks of Paul as he finishes out this letter. And uh, the first one, I, I want, and it may be the most important, but I don't know that any of them are more important than the other, but I want you to understand this morning that if you're a child of God, you're going to be made like Jesus because God is faithful to complete you. God is faithful. God does what he says. And he's promised that he's going to do it. And we see that he, he follows up what he said in verse 23 with what he, with what he writes in verse 24. He, he simply says, he who calls you, that's God, right? God calls you to salvation. He draws you to him. And he leads you to follow him and believe in him. And he is faithful. And then he says he, he, he will do it. He'll do what? What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about sanctifying you completely in body, soul, and spirit. That's what he's talking about. And presenting you blameless to Christ at his return. 
And so here again, like we've, we've shown you in every chapter throughout this letter, which Paul didn't write it in chapters, but every little bit, as he closes out thoughts, he points to the return of Christ, just like he does here when he finishes out his letter. He's, he's talking about the last days. And, and I want you to understand, you know, God always keeps his promises. Did y'all know that? God cannot not keep his promise. Does that make sense? <laughs> he cannot not keep his promise. He must keep his promises. That is his character. What God says, he does. And I like that, don't you? Because I know a few people who, they're not that way. Right? And, uh, you know, even Balaam. Back in the Old Testament, y'all familiar with the story of Balaam and his donkey? Um, I, I preached from that text a while back. It's in a series we did called Strange Stories in the Bible. If you're interested in that, it, it was fun. It was difficult to kind of think. But Balaam understood, you know, he, he understood this. And in, in, in the story in Numbers 23, 19, he says, God is not a man that he should lie. Now, he knew men lied, didn't he? And that's the truth. People will lie to you. And eventually, everybody lies, don't they? If you say you don't, you know what? You're a liar. Okay, that's right. Some of y'all got it. So, but, but he says, nor a son of man that he should repent. God doesn't need to repent. God is holy. And he says, and will he not do or has he spoken that he will not make it good? You see, God has promised you eternal life. And he's promised that he's going to shape you and conform you into the image of his son if you are his. That's the promise of, of sanctification. It's a process, but it's a completion. And once you're sanctified, you're going to be glorified. And when you're glorified, you're made like Jesus. And so justification happens immediately. These are some big church words. You might want to write them down. They're good to know. But justified is when you believe on Jesus and immediately you are legally declared innocent before God. That means you're saved. And when you stand before God and he judges you, he's not going to see your sin because it's been dismissed because of Jesus. So that's something to shout about, right? Immediately that happens. And then begins this process of sanctification where the Holy Spirit indwells you and God starts teaching you and shaping you into the image of Christ. So that you, there ought to, if you are justified, if you are saved, then there ought to be some change that people notice in your life as you become more and more like Jesus. That's sanctification. And when that's done, which it'll be done when Christ returns, the process will be complete and you'll be blameless and you'll be presented blameless and you'll be glorified. And that's when you'll be completed like Jesus. And so God has promised this. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, he says, For whom he foreknew, that's the ones he, 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 uh, he knew would be saved. Those are the ones he's, he saves. He says he also predestined them so it went to be conformed to the image of his son. You see that? If you're saved, God makes a way for you to be changed in the image of his son. That's, this, is, this is why I'm saying this. Because it's in the Bible. And God does not lie. Right? <laughs> Paul uh, told Titus in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. He's, he's given him some certainty about this message of the hope of eternal life. Which God who cannot lie promised long ago. That's what he says in Titus 1-2. And so God cannot lie because it's just contrary to who he is. He fulfills his promise, promises. The Bible says God's immutable. You know what that means? It means he doesn't change. He's the same as he always has been. He's good and righteous and holy and worthy of praise and glory. And he's all powerful forever and ever. He's always been like that. He's like that now. And he's always going to be like that. That's, that's how God is. And so and he doesn't change. And, and Hebrews says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, and uh, James wrote in his letter, he says, there's not even a shadow of turning. You know, you know the sun and, and shadows, you know how they'll play tricks on you. Not with God. 
Not even an indication that he might be changing. None of that. But I want you to note what John wrote in 1 John 3, 2. He says, Beloved, now we are the children of God. Amen to that, right? And then notice what he says, And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. So we're already the children of God. Is that not good enough? There's something better coming. <laughs> you know? And, and we, don't, we can't even see that yet. But, but he, say, he says this, But when we, know, we know that when he is revealed, when Christ is revealed, just like uh, Paul's writing in our text for today, he says, We shall be like him. You see that? <laughs> Woo! That's right. God is faithful to do what he says. And he will do it. He will sanctify you. Not too long ago, I voluntarily placed myself under a, a, a leader in a role that I'm not going to name to just serve some people, you know. And um, I'm not going to call a name out because I don't want to call this person out. But, but um, he, he was a genuine person and he really did a good job. But, but after serving with him for a while, I noticed one consistent inconsistency. <laughs> and it just bothered me. And, and, I, and I, I don't think it was really intentional. I really don't. I, I don't think it was intentional. I just... You know, think it's just sort of his personality. But what it was was he frequently made promises that he just wouldn't keep. You know, I, I think he would say them and he wouldn't write them down and he'd forget and he'd put it off. And, you know, and it just drove me nuts because I don't like that. It just, you know, and, and it just, you know, and, and, and I, don't, I don't even know if there was any that he didn't, prom didn't do for me. But it wasn't that that was bothering me. It was the other people that we were trying to serve that he wasn't living up to the promises that bothered me. But... You know, and, and so I confronted him a few times, you know, and I would remind him, you know, that he said this and that he was going to do this, but it just didn't seem to help, you know. Uh, but, you know, but thankfully, our God's not like that at all. He doesn't need a reminder, and he doesn't forget what he says he does. And I hope you can see this morning that God is faithful. And that um, he has promised those who are his that one day when Christ returns that you will be made like him. <laughs> That's good news, folks. And, but maybe you feel like I do, you know. Uh, bring it on because I, 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 I'm a mess. I need it, right? And, 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 you know, I'm so grateful that my salvation doesn't depend on my works and me remembering things and me keeping my promises. And you know what else? I'm glad it don't depend on you doing the same thing for me. It just all depends on God and his faithfulness, doesn't it? And, and, and so uh, because I know Jesus, I know he's at work in me and he has saved me and he's teaching me to be like him and he's revealing himself to me who he is and how he is and one day that work will be complete. And I'll be like him. Praise the Lord. Amen. And you're being made like Jesus. And God is faithful to complete you. That's, that's the first truth I want you to understand about your sanctification. Another truth about your sanctification is this. And, and this, this follows up with the next few verses. And it, it's that the church is faithful to help you. And, and what I mean by this is that, you know, this process of sanctification, this process of becoming like Jesus, you need the church for that. Eventually, God's going to complete you because the church can't really do it. But, but, but I need you and you need me and y'all need each other. Did you know that? <laughs> and hopefully I can, I can show you this in the text today. Um, your brothers and sisters in Christ are available to help you. If you look in verses 25, 26, and 27, he mentions the brethren in every one of them. And he, he's, it's not just the brethren. When he says brethren, he means sister and two, okay? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know if that's a King James word or not, but uh, we'll throw it out there. I think y'all got it. But, um, you know, we see some requests here on how the church can be faithful 
to help bring our sanctification uh, to where you know we're, we're being made more and more like Jesus, and and we see the first way the church can help in verse twenty five, where he, you know Paul simply says, "Brethren, pray for us," and you know prayer is important. And we've talked about prayer a few times. And I, I, we talked about it last week, so so y'all are getting it again. I guess y'all need this bad. I don't know, but but uh, but 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 the church can be helpful to your sanctification through faithful prayer. You know what? I can be more made more like Jesus if you fa- pray for me faithfully. Y'all understand that? And you can be more like Jesus more efficiently if I pray for you faithfully. And we all pray for each other, right? That, this, is, this is the point I'm trying to make with this about prayer. You know, you see, Paul understood... You know, life is difficult, isn't it? Uh, you know, it's, it, we all struggle with the flesh. You know, we have these enemies of God that, and the gospel that are around us. And people are trying to destroy the church. They're trying to destroy pastors. They're trying, you know, they'll trip people up. It makes, sometimes it just makes people feel better when they know that, you, you know, or they feel like you're worse off than they are. You know, I don't know. That's the only thing, only thing I can come up with. But, and, and, you know, we wrestle, like Ephesians 6 says, with the spiritual wickedness, the demonic realm. You know, Satan knows our weaknesses, and he attacks those. And he uses people to that. I mean, it can get rough. And, 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 but you see, your key, listen to me, one of the keys for you to be made like Jesus is to act like Jesus. You know, and that's the reason we say living and loving like Jesus here, because that's what we want to do. We want to be made like Jesus. We want to live like Jesus, and we want to love people like Jesus loves people. And, and, and you know, Jesus, he prayed. <laughs> did, did you ever notice that? Jesus prayed. I mean, if anybody didn't need to pray, you'd think it'd be the Son of God who knows all things already. <laughs> but he prayed. And he prayed as a man. And, and you know, when, we, when you read the Gospels, in fact, you see Jesus spending entire nights in prayer. And when he called his disciples, go back and read it. It says he spent the entire night in prayer praying about this. You see, prayer is our lifeline to the Father. And, and if we're going to grow and be like Jesus, we've got to pray like Jesus. If Jesus needed to spend all night in prayer, how much time do we need? Think about it. Whew. That's convicting, I know. But we need to understand the truth of what Jesus said in John 15. You know, in John 15, I think it's verse 5, but the, the sense of the whole passage is this, apart from me, you can do nothing. We need this attachment and relationship with, with the Lord and our strength. It's not found in programs or our talents. It's not found in, um, you know, uh, uh, flowery words or, you know, graphics that we produce. It's not found in vision statements or in organizational structure. Our strength is in the Lord. And in our relationship with Him is only strong if we spend time in prayer. Paul knew that. Jesus knew that. And so not only must we pray, but we got to pray for one another. There's not a person in the world that doesn't need prayer. I mean, I, I, I guarantee you, if I walk through this room and one by one, I ask, can I pray for you? Everybody's going to say, yeah. Because, you know, nobody in their right mind is going to turn down prayer. You know? <laughs> And not only do we need to pray for those who are experiencing difficulties, but we need to pray for each other uh, all the time before difficulties arise. A lot of times, you know, we're praying for a big toe or something, and, and you know, uh, but, but so-and-so over here is getting ready to face a line, you know? <laughs> and Paul asks for prayer, and that just reminds us that we should be praying for one another. But, but prayer isn't the only way the church can be faithful to help. The church can be helpful to your sanctification through faithful, loving fellowship. Look at verse 26. He says, he says greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. All right. 
yeah, let's talk about this. I, that, I had a guy I used to work with, he said, after he needed to go to church, because the Bible said we ought to do this, and nobody does it. I said, like, that's a good reason. No. You know, it's not. It, you know, it, it, the kiss is described as a holy kiss, so first of all, let's just make it clear, there's nothing sexual about it at all. You know, it, it, and, and some of y'all, y'all know, it's just a standard greeting of the culture. Much like you see in a lot of cultures today when people greet one another with a little peck on the cheek. And, you know, and a lot of times they don't even actually touch each other with their mouth. You know, I, I don't know if they still do that now that COVID's been around. I, I don't know. But, but, um, but, but that, that, this is the prescription that, that Paul, you know, he mentioned this in both letters to Corinth. He wrote to do this in Romans and then Peter used it in one of his epistles, I think Second Peter, he, he says, you know, in our culture, we just don't do it, right? I mean, you know, some people may, but, 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 you know, we just don't greet one another this way. But we do offer a holy handshake, don't we? We do that. And, uh, you know, when COVID was hot, we, we offered holy fist bumps. And when it was really hot, we did the elbow touches. Uh, I guess you could call them holy. We're just trying to figure out a way to greet one another in a special way. Even though we didn't want to, you know, we wanted to remain six feet apart. So, how you doing, I guess, you know. Uh, uh, I don't know. But, uh, but here's the thing. I want you to understand. This is about greeting one another. So, I think the key is, it's about fellowship with one another. It's about coming together. Because when you greet someone, you're with them. And, you know, and, and I think it's important for us to come together for fellowship as, as believers in Christ. And, you know, from, from time to time, and Austin and I were talking about this Wednesday night, but from, from time to time, I hear people, you know, say, oh, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You know who tell you that? It's people who don't go to church. They, they don't want to have to go to church. So uh, that, that's who always says that. It's, it's you know, this... But, you know, and, and technically that may be true. You may be saved and not go to church. And you may make it into heaven and be with Jesus. But, but if you are, uh, listen to me, if you're a genuine follower of Christ, you know, and I realize there's some people who can't come to church because I know we have some watchers and viewers who are in nursing homes or, you know, their health just doesn't allow them. And, and I, you know, and, and I'm not talking to you, but... But I'm talking to healthy people who can get out and be a part of a church. And, but, but, but listen, if you're a genuine follower of Christ, you want fellowship with other Christians. It, it's in your heart. You cannot live without it. You want to be other, around other Christians. It's an essential part of your relationship with God. You know why? Because God loves them. And you love them too. Because God loves them and God's in you. And it just, it just comes out. You know, I, I, don't, I mean, that's just it. And, and, um, but, but, you know, it's through that love for one another, through our relationship with one another and our working together that the love of God is released and revealed in a dark and sinful world. People need to see us loving one another. Did you know that? <laughs> I mean, so, you know, you might not have to go to church to be a Christian, I'll go if I have to, I guess. I, I don't know. You know, you don't have to. Because if that's your attitude, you probably shouldn't go anyway. Yeah? But, but, but you want to go. But you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But listen, to be a good one, you do. To be a good Christian, you do. You know, and, and, and you know, if you want to be like Jesus, which lies at the deepest part of a born-again believer you want to be a part of a local church. You want to worship with other believers. You want to serve others alongside other believers, other brothers and sisters in Christ. You desire that fellowship with them, and it's an essential part of your growth as a Christian. You can't grow up all alone. You leave a newborn by itself, it ain't going to make it. And the same thing will happen to you spiritually. We need one another. Read this exhortation to the Hebrews with me in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. He, he writes, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good work. So we ought to be thinking about one another. We ought to be meeting together. He says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That's, you know, don't, don't stop coming together. So it's in the Bible. God tells us to do it. You know, but... 
He says, exhorting one another. You know, don't stop coming together as some are doing, but and even more as you see the day approaching, the day of the return of Christ. So you can clearly see that part of the process of becoming like Jesus involves the church in prayer and fellowship. But there's one more we see in verse 27. And he says this, he says, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. So another part of being faithful with the church that helps you grow is, you know, we don't just come together for prayer and fellowship, but we come together to read and study the, the, and apply the word of God. And so in verse 27, Paul's basically saying, I want to make, I want you to make a solemn oath before the Lord that you'll read this letter to every person in the church publicly so that they can hear and obey the word of the living God. That's basically what he's saying. And so, you know, they, they hand wrote all this so they couldn't run back to the copy room and, and run off copies and say, here, take this home with you and read it. You know, they, they couldn't do that. They, they couldn't copy and paste it in a meme on Facebook. You know, so that wasn't an option for them. A lot of them probably were illiterate. You know, so it needed to be read out loud for them to understand it. And so this emphasizes, you know, it emphasizes the authority and the importance of reading and understanding and obeying the word of God. Remember these words from Paul to Timothy in his second letter to Timothy. He, he's talking to Timothy and he says, remember that from childhood you've known the Holy Scriptures. And they've been able to make you wise for salvation in Christ Jesus. So the scriptures brought Timothy to faith in Christ. And they will, anybody who's saved has to hear the word of truth from scripture. And then he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Listen to this, that the man of God may be complete. That's what we've been talking about, isn't it? Be made complete. Being made like Jesus, but thoroughly equipped for every good work. That you may grow and become capable of living up to the things that God has prepared for you to do. So if you're going to live like Jesus and be made like him, you've got to submit yourself to the word of God. And you've got to pray for one another and you've got to fellowship with one another. I, I recently read um, a few benefits for being a faithful church member that... James Merritt, a pastor down in Georgia who had posted, and apparently he got them from a lady named Jane Chastain in a book or an article, and um, this, these are a few things he said. Churchgoers are more likely to have stable, happy marriages. This is from a few years ago, 1996, so I'm sure it's still fairly applicable to today. He says, regular attend church attenders experience less depression. More self-esteem, fewer out-of-wedlock births, less drug abuse, fewer suicides, less crime, and fewer instances of divorce. They live longer. They have less heart disease. And they have a quicker rate of recovery from illness. Finally, church attendance and religious belief is a major cause of strength and recovery from damage caused by alcoholism, drug addiction, and marital breakdown. So, <laughs> you know, folks, just being actively involved and faithful in your church family obviously helps you become more like Jesus. And as we close out this letter, I want to take one, la one look, take a look at one last truth about what helps you be made more and more like Jesus. And that's in verse 28, the last verse in the text, that God's grace will complete you, is what I want you to understand from this. He says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So this is just a standard closing to the book. But it, the word grace is a good summary for the work of God in us. The grammatical structure places an emphasis that Jesus Christ is the the. Lord, our Lord, and it's his grace that Paul wants to be evident in the Thessalonican church. And so the grace of the Lord Jesus is the love of God granting you blessed gifts 
that you don't deserve. That, that's grace. But when you hear the word grace, it primarily refers to the free gift of salvation. It refers to the gospel. The gospel of grace, you might hear sometimes. But it's, it's talking about the free gift of salvation available to everyone who believes on Christ. Because of his atoning work. And they believe that he can save them. That's grace. There's, you see, there's nothing you can do to earn God's grace. Because you can't earn a gift. If you earn it, it's not a gift, is it? It's a simple, loving gift from God to you. Grace is the source of our salvation, for it's by grace, Ephesians 2, 8 says, that you're saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. And then he says, not of work, so that no person can boast. You see, grace is the means by which we can live the Christian life, for it's the Holy Spirit the gift of the Holy Spirit, the grace that God gives us, the Holy Spirit, that enlightens and empowers us to walk and serve Christ. It's, it's God's grace that gives us hope in the return of Christ and, and, and to fulfill His mission and, and to live out His promises. In Ephesians 2, just leading up to the verse I just quoted, it says this, in verses 4 through 6, he says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, that's sin, basically, made us alive together with Christ. And then he says, By grace you've been saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. <laughs> It's, it's God's grace that, that, that completes us and it's God's grace that saves us and it's God's grace that's going to sanctify us and complete us and make us like Jesus. It's, it's God's work. It's God's work. It's God's work in you. And so, so some of you remember a story about a little boy who was, who was uh, bothering his father and his father was reading a magazine and, and the father decided... To distract his little boy by giving him something to do, and and he took a page out of the magazine and he cut it up into pieces, and you know it was an article, and so he he had the little boy try to put it back together, you know, and he said that ought to occupy him for a little while, but he was wrong. In in, in just a, a just a minute or so, the little boy had had put it all back together and had it all taped, and and he handed it to his dad, and his dad said, "How in the world did you do that so quickly?" And the boy said, it was easy. There was a picture of a man on the other side. And he said, when I got the man right, everything else fell into place. <laughs> and that's true, you know. You, you see, when you're right about Jesus, when you allow him to, to pick up the pieces of your life and to put them all together, he'll make you like him. And so that's, what, that's, that's the plea today. Will you give the misplaced pieces of your life to Jesus? Will you surrender to him? Will you give him your life and allow him to save you and put you back together the way he wants you to be by his design? When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll do that. He will save you. And he will complete you. He is faithful. He uses the church to help you. But ultimately, it's his grace. It's his love that, that completes you. That's, that's why he can promise it, because he's going to do it. But you've got to give yourself to him. Let's bow our heads and let's pray and let's respond in faith this morning. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. God, we're thankful for your grace and your work. God, help us today all to surrender in faith to you, give ourselves to you completely. And Lord, walk in faith, helping one another as you conform us and shape us into the image of Christ. Save souls now, change lives forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together and let's respond.